my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Family Album. I've been using the Family Album app for the last year ever since my brother and sister-in-law adopted my baby nephew. We were all so excited to see all of the pictures when he was born, but they needed a secure and private way to share photos and videos with us, especially during the tenuous time awaiting the adoption to be finalized. Long story short, we all became obsessed with the usability of this app and it brought our entire extended family closer together as we could each leave comments on the photos and give our accounts fun nicknames. I might have even teared up a little bit when I created that Aunt Bryn name for the first time. The Family Album app is totally secure and I love that there's no third-party ads or unwanted eyes. There's unlimited storage and it's totally free. A few of the cool features I've discovered using the app are that it automatically sorts photos and videos by month, allowing you to swipe back in time and see how your child has grown. Another neat feature is you can order eight free photo prints every month to be delivered to your home, which comes in so handy for having actual tangible prints for framing or doing like my sister-in-law did and creating a banner of photos for baby's first birthday. So to all the parents out there still trying to use iMessage or Google Photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app with unlimited storage. Head over to the app store, search family album, one word, download the app and start creating and sharing in the day-to-day joys of those precious early years. Thank you so much to everyone who has reached out and offered support as I'm recovering from my appendectomy Um, and for all the new Patreon members, it really means a lot to me. If you want to join that community, you can find out more at patreon.com slash birth hour. Today, we are back with part two of Blair's story. She's going to share how her midwives helped her get through her challenging postpartum, and then we're going to hear a really redeeming birth and postpartum experience with her second baby. And this really sweet midwife, Julie, I just love her. She was like an angel from heaven, and she was an older midwife who had been around a while and she sat down with me and I explained everything I just said. And she put her hand on me and she said, Blair, you're experiencing pretty severe postpartum anxiety and depression, and we need to treat this immediately. And those thoughts that you're having are called intrusive thoughts. And it's not a reflection of you as a mother. And I just sat there and sobbed. And it was just really validating for me to hear that, you know, I'm not going crazy. I truly felt like I was going crazy and I wasn't feeling bonded. I didn't even feel like I knew where I was. I felt out of my body. It was so bad. I even revisiting it now, like it, I f- have this feeling come over me because I just wouldn't wish anyone to be in that place. Like it's just a dark, lonely, hard place. My husband was as supportive as he could be. He stayed home as much as he could be, but I was going through it. And so, you know, and he had to get back to work. We're both self-employed. You can't, there's no paternity leave. <laughs> like the paternity leave is days that you're not working, you know? So it was, it, it just was hard. So this sweet midwife, Julie, really, like she just got me. She could tell that like this was not going well and that I didn't have the bandwidth to truly advocate for myself or do much of anything at this point. So she actually called the OBGYN that works, that they had a really great working relationship with, with the birth center. She called this OBGYN and made an appointment on my behalf. And she didn't even ask me days or times. She just came back into the room and said, okay, next Wednesday at 2 p.m., you have this appointment. Here's the address. Here's where you need to go. And I just can't thank her enough for doing that for me because like, if she had told me that I needed to find an OBGYN and go see one, there's just, I could not. So the, there were two reasons why she wanted me to go see a doctor. One reason was because I was struggling so deeply with my mental health. And at that time at Origins, they didn't have someone who could prescribe me medications. Now they do. And with my son, they did, but they didn't at that time. And so they wanted me to go get on, or at least have the conversation about getting on an SSRI or some kind of anxiety, you know, antidepressant pill or medication. The other thing was she checked my stitches. And now at five weeks postpartum, my stitches should have been pretty much completely dissolved if not completely dissolved and they were not dissolved at all. And so my tissue was healing, but then 
the stitches hadn't dissolved at all. So it was healing. But then as I was walking around or moving around, it was pulling that healed, fresh, raw tissue. And it was no wonder I was in like 10 out of 10 pain, worst pain of my life at day and night. It was no wonder I couldn't get out of bed. Like I was in so much excruciating pain. So about a week later, I went to this appointment, you know, with this OBGYN and through no fault of the OBGYN, just because of what this day held, this was definitely in the bottom 10% days of my life. Awful. It was an awful day. So I live like an hour and a half outside of the city of Dallas and this OBGYN was in Dallas. So I had to, you know, get myself dressed, which at this point felt like an impossible task. I wasn't even leaving my room, let alone leaving the house. So I had to get myself dressed, get my baby dressed, get ourselves, you know, get together and drive down an hour and a half somewhere I didn't know, figure out parking, all of that, which now, like today, I could do that so easily without stress. But then it was really hard for me. I was in such a bad mental place. So we get down there. The appointment lasted about an hour. And we started by going over my mental health. And she said, yes, you obviously do have postpartum depression and anxiety. We're going to start you on this medication. I want you to start on a half dose. After two weeks, go up to a full dose. Let me know. Like, Keep in touch. She was really thorough. I really appreciated her. And then after that, she decided to, you know, obviously, I said, I really would like you to also examine me because I'm still in excruciating pain at five weeks postpartum after a third degree tear. So she went ahead and examined me. And this examination was just really traumatic, really, really painful because of the situation that was going on. And I obviously didn't know that there was such a problem, but she just sighed and I knew something was really wrong. So come to find out, I am in the very, very rare category of people whose bodies don't break down this particular type of suture material. Usually people who don't break it down are allergic to it, so I must be allergic to it. And it's called Vicryl and it's like the number one suture material used for women after childbirth because it's like supposed to be the best one. And yet my body didn't break it down and I was super allergic to it. So I was also really irritated and inflamed. And so my stitch had not dissolved. My tissue was starting to heal, but was being pulled back open with this suture material that hadn't dissolved. And so it was like, no wonder I was in such excruciating pain. And then all of that had caused a four centimeter patch internally, like right inside my vagina of granulated scar tissue, which is very, very painful. It like creates a really throbbing sensation. So once this was all explained to me, it actually gave me a better picture of why I was in so much pain. But I was also thinking, what are we about to do about this? Because you know, I'm five weeks postpartum now and I'm not feeling, I'm feeling like worse than I ever have. So she explained to me that unfortunately, my situation was never going to get better without surgery and that she needed to go in and basically recut me, restitch me, cut out that four, four centimeters is a lot in a vagina. So she had to go in there and do all of that. And so I remember getting in my car that day to drive home. I turned the car on and I remember sitting there and sobbing, like my body was shaking, just sobbing and thinking, I've got to drive this baby and I home 90 minutes. Mm. And I feel like, like I just, you know, yeah. bad. Yeah. It was so bad. So I got home and I explained the whole situation to my husband and, you know, he's great. He was like, listen, I'm so sorry. This is awful, but we are going to get through this. Like we're going to find a way, we'll figure it out. And so for insurance purposes, we ended up scheduling surgery on December 31st at 8 a.m. Just in the nick of time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, she's like, I don't normally do this, but I feel so bad for basically, but I feel so bad for you that I'll do it. And I'm like, thanks girl. I really appreciate it. (laughs) So my parents flew into town to help take care of Nora and just stay with us for like a week after this, because I was not in a good place and I really needed that extra support and I really appreciate them. So I live in Texas and they're across the country where I grew up in Maryland. So, you know, they came and put their life on hold. I really appreciated that. My husband and I drove down, went in and they put me under anesthesia and did this procedure. Of course, I was asleep. I didn't you know, know what was happening. And I woke up and I was a little bit sleepy, but it, I felt pretty good. But my perineum and all that whole area just felt like it was on fire. It hurt so bad. It was burning. And so I had been prescribed very strong pain medication. And the doctor had said, you know, this is pretty aggressive surgery. Most people would want to take this. 
but I really felt uncomfortable taking such a strong medication with a breastfeeding baby. And now looking back, I don't know what the right answer was. Like, I wish I hadn't been in that much pain, but I also understand wanting to protect a very brand new baby. So it was just a rough situation to be recovering from surgery and feeling nervous to take something that would help with the pain. So the pain continued for a while. For two or three days, I couldn't get out of bed at all. The recovery was really rough. For weeks, I was in pain. It was just hard. So I started the antidepressant though a couple of weeks before this surgery. So I was mentally starting to feel a little bit less cloudy, which was helpful. However, the recovery from surgery did not go as planned. Um, My mental health, like I said, was definitely improving very slowly. However, I had had to have four follow-up appointments that all required revisions after my surgery. Oh my gosh. So... One time she had to burn off more scar tissues. One time she had to cut off more stitches. One time she had to inject lidocaine and recut an incision and re-sew it. The next time she had to recut that same incision because it didn't heal quite right. It just went on and on and on. And it was, I was in such a trauma state. Like every time I would walk into that office, I would get this awful feeling. I'd be shaking. I would, it was horrible. Yeah, that's awful. So emotional too. I know I've talked about that before, but just like, that area of your body being injured is obviously super painful, but so emotional too. It really was. I felt so much shame. And now looking back with a clear mind and a healthy mind, I don't fully understand this, but at the time I felt like I was doing something wrong. Like why wouldn't my body heal? This is like my the womanly part of my body that wouldn't heal. And I just was, it, it made me feel so like a shell of myself. Mm. It was so hard. I was in so much pain. And so this was for months. So the initial surgery was on December 31st. And this went on all through January and all through February, which is of 2020, February of 2020. So finally, late February of 2020, I had my final revision, my final everything. And everything was like, finally, I was on the up and up. And I still had... Basically from that day was like the beginning of my real healing. And then it was COVID. So I had been at home and really struggling. And then, you know, mid-March, of course, we're, we're going into lockdown. And so that was hard in some ways. But I will say on a silver lining note that I felt like my postpartum had been super robbed from me and my bonding time with my baby. And having the whole world shut down definitely made me feel like I could just really focus on bonding with my baby and enjoying her and not feeling the pressure to do much of anything. And so that was that was nice, although it was really hard because I had already been pretty much at home alone in my room for months. So I um, ended up doing a little bit of pelvic floor physical therapy before all the lockdowns really happened. I think I did three sessions to help work on breaking up that scar tissue and just finishing up the healing. The healing went on and I mean, we weren't able to be intimate like in any capacity probably for eight full months. It was so hard. And at that point, when things started to heal up, I was just so grateful to close this chapter behind me and so grateful that I had had the care and the advocacy that I had had. I can't imagine what this would have looked like because it was already such a mess if I had had not had a great care team. Yeah. So at eight months out, was it still, I imagine, like didn't feel like 100% back to normal? Exactly. It was still tight. It still felt kind of sore and just weird, honestly. But there wasn't really a lot of pain, Mm -hmm. which I was so grateful for. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and hear about your second birth. Okay. So because it took us a year to get pregnant with our daughter, we thought it would probably take a while to get pregnant with our second baby. So we started trying kind of before we were really ready necessarily to be pregnant. But lo and behold, we got pregnant the very first month we tried, which was in January of 2021. So we had another October baby due date. And so our kids are almost exactly two years apart. I felt a lot more prepared for pregnancy this second time around, but I didn't realize how hard it would be to go through all of the pregnancy stuff 
with a toddler in my care. Like it was hard. There was no like napping and resting. <laughs> it's just so you just got to push through. So I, you know, I was really, really nauseous for about 20 weeks of the pregnancy. I had awful pregnancy rhinitis, which makes you feel like you have this horrible head cold and you can't really take much of anything when you're pregnant. So I just didn't feel well. And I had gone off of my SSRI, which was my anti-anxiety, antidepressive medication at the beginning of the pregnancy. So my mental health was really struggling as well. But I took the time, even though it wasn't the easiest pregnancy, I did take the time during the pregnancy to really prepare for birth, but really more over postpartum. I was actually excited to give birth again, but I was really in a trauma state about having to go through postpartum again because of what I had experienced. So I went and found a therapist who specialized in birth trauma. I started seeing her. We worked through a variety of things. She used a variety of techniques. The one that stands out to me was the EMDR therapy, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's an extremely powerful way of working through trauma in the brain. And it was 100% effective for me in being able to put perspective to my trauma. And so that when I think about and talk about, you know, these procedures and all this nonsense that went down throughout my postpartum with my first kid, like it doesn't bring up every awful feeling and it doesn't send me into a spiral, which I really appreciate. So even though the pregnancy was hard and I I was doing that, I also was doing um, a lot of pelvic floor physical therapy, like almost once a week for obvious reasons to try to get my body ready to stretch and birth another baby, hopefully not have another third degree tear. I took a lot of supplements this time in addition to, you know, the standard ones I can think of off the top of my head, taking collagen every morning just to help with my tissue, stretching, healing, all of that kind of thing. I was praying a lot during this time. I just wanted this pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, mainly heavy on the postpartum, just to be super different because it was just so hard the first time. And one thing that was fun was that we found that we were expecting a boy and we had had a girl, so it was fun to have one of each. And so fast forward through the pregnancy because nothing major happened during the pregnancy to early October when he was due. I was thinking this time there's no way that I was going to go a full 10 days past like I had the last time, but of course I did. (laughs) So I had had a lot of prodromal labor, a lot, a lot of prodromal labor, and they were pretty intense. There was a Sunday. He was born on a Monday morning. And so on that Sunday, I was having prodromal labor and I was having every 15 minutes, I was having a pretty intense contraction, but they were never getting closer together. They were never building. So we got up and I was like, well, let's just do the day. So we went to church. Then we went to Cracker Barrel and ate brunch. I definitely got some looks at Cracker Barrel when I'm like trying to eat my pancakes and I'm like moaning through these little, they weren't that bad, but they were enough. So I was really eager to get things going. I hooked up to the breast pump. I was drinking an insane amount of red raspberry leaf tea. I don't think you're supposed to drink that much red raspberry leaf tea. Like I think I put eight tea bags in one cup. I was like, let's go. I'm so done with being pregnant. (laughs) So by Sunday evening, I was having some more powerful contractions, but still nothing was building. And my midwives had advised that I take a Unisom, just half of a Unisom to help my body relax and rest. So at 1030 in the evening, I took a Unisom and got in bed to go to sleep. And then it all began. And this was, it was just so fast. So at 1045, I had taken a Unisom, a sleep aid at 1030. 1045, I wake up with these wild contractions, like aggressive contractions. And when I got up, they were about seven minutes apart. And then by 11.30, so about 45 minutes later, they were just continuing to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so I'm thinking, all right, it's time to go. So around 11.45, about an hour after I had originally woke up, we start gathering everything and getting it into the truck. Now, I'm saying this sounds so crazy, but because obviously I was in a super, super active labor at this point. But after what I went through with Nora, where it just took so long, I was genuinely thinking, I still have six more hours. I mean, truly, I'm thinking we still have quite a while. Alas, we did not have six more hours. So then I get this shaking come over me and I am shaking uncontrollably and my legs are shaking and my teeth are clattering. And at that point, my husband calls my doula, calls the birth center and he's like, listen, like this is for real. She kind of doesn't believe it's for real, but she is shaking. She is moaning, groaning. Like she sounds like she is like getting there. And so they were like, well, come on down to the birth center since it's an hour drive. 
I will not say that we were racing around the house. In hindsight, I wish we had, but we were not racing around the house. We thought, I truly thought I still had at least six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours before this baby was coming. As we're racing around the house to get ready, loading things in the car, the contractions are going from five minutes, then every four minutes, and then they're every two minutes. Right as we're getting in the car, they're coming every two minutes. I, I, I kind of am shocked I still got in the car. I think I was like, this is the plan and this is what we're doing. So we get in the car. My husband's driving. My mom's sitting in the front passenger seat. I wanted to sit in the back so I would have more room. And then we had the infant car seat strapped in, you know, on the other side of the back seat. I was still having slight breaks between contractions at this point. Like I said, about two minutes apart. So I looked at the clock. It was 1223 in the morning and we get on the highway. As soon as we hit the highway, I start getting double peaking contractions. And that is when you get to the height of a contraction and then it goes up another level to like another full contraction. And it was so intense. It was just so intense. And I felt really, really out of control. With my daughter, the labor was really long and hard, but I definitely felt in control of my breathing. This time I did not. I felt completely out of control. And I was actually... I was not handling it well. And so I grabbed onto the infant car seat and I actually clawed it so hard that I ripped a big hole in it because I was trying to work through these insane contractions that were double peaking, never ending, back to back to back on this one hour drive. Oh my gosh, (laughs) that's hardcore. (laughs) It was so wild. It was so wild. Riley's like got his foot on the gas. We are trying to get down 35. Thank goodness it was in the middle of the night because... It would have been a highway baby 100%, if not. So I'm still delusional. I'm still thinking, oh, we still have a couple more hours, even as this is all happening. And I remember yelling out, I need a break. I need a break. Because they just kept coming. And my mom's like, you're doing great, sweetie. Keep going. So halfway through our one-hour drive, 30 minutes in, I start feeling the ring of fire. And I start feeling the feeling of crowning, which is a really specific feeling. And it's very unmistakable and I didn't say anything for five minutes or so because I'm even in this crazy labor land that I was in, there was this part of my brain that was like, surely not. Surely you are not having this baby. Surely this baby's not crowning right now. Like you labor just began. And so then I started hearing a grunting sound like behind my contractions. I was not putting it there. It was just happening as I was working through them. I could hear myself starting to grunt and kind of push. And so then I voiced that and I said, I'm starting to push. I can feel his head. And the look between the two of them was like, oh no. Because we were, I thought we were maybe five minutes away. I was in labor land. We were 30 full minutes away from the birth center. So Riley's like, do you want me to pull over? I'm like, no, do not pull over. (laughs) Get there, get there. I'm like, I'm like out of my mind. So he calls the midwives and puts them on speakerphone. And you know, they're the best. And they're like, Blair... I know this is a lot. We need you to breathe like you're blowing out birthday candles. You really need to breathe like you're blowing out birthday candles. They were just trying to stop me from putting any oomph behind the contractions so that I wasn't pushing this baby out in the middle, you know, on I-35. And I remember yelling, this is a forest fire. What do you mean birthday candles? I'm like screaming at them, (laughs) which is... (laughs) Like there were a few choice words in there as well, which is not normally my demeanor towards, you know, my midwives. But I I was just like, what are you talking about? Like this is not, there's no birthday candles to be found. Like this is so insane. And so I remember feeling like I needed to take my pants off because this baby was coming out of my body. But in this crazy state of mind, in this really intense labor state of mind, I remember thinking, that it was impossible. Like, how was I going to get these pants off? And so I was pulling at my waistband and tugging at my waistband. And I could not get these leggings off. And I was like thinking, I don't know, like, I guess he's going to come out. I, don't, I just was in this state. And so finally I hear my mom say, six more minutes, Blair, you can do it six more minutes. So I really was like willing my body to keep this baby in until we got to the birth center. Because in my mind, I also am thinking through in my mind at this time that if I have this baby now, what if I start hemorrhaging? What if it's another velamentous cord insertion? What if, like all these what ifs of what happened the last time are going through my head. So I'm pretty nervous. So we pull into the birth center parking lot and I have like a movie water breaking pop. So I hear a pop, my water breaks. It was my husband's like brand new to him truck and I got it all, <laughs> this 
amniotic fluid just everywhere. <laughs> I'm like, this is the price of doing business. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. Um, so the, all the midwives were standing outside. It was actually like an unseasonably warm night because it was in October. This was October 11th. And they were all standing outside with a delivery kit. And they're like, do you want to go inside? And I was like, well, yeah. And they're like, can you walk? And I'm like, no, not really. So they sort of half, I hobbled and they carried me and we got inside. And I was like, all I want to do is get in the tub. I just want to get in the birth tub. They were like, okay, well, we just, they, it was already filled up. It was warm. It looked so appealing. And it's so funny because I felt like it was impossible to swing my leg over and get in that birth tub. And I remember putting my hands on the edge of the tub and saying, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Meaning I don't know how I'm going to get in the birth tub. Like I wasn't worried about giving birth, but I didn't know how I was going to like, step into a bathtub. And they're like, you can, you can do it. And so as I was standing there with my hands on the edge, swaying my hips, the midwife was standing behind me and she said, four centimeters of head visible, five centimeters of head visible, nine centimeters of head visible in quick succession, just like that. Like his head was just coming. And then that's when one of them looked at me real earnestly. And she said, it's time to get in the tub if you'd like to get in the tub. And I was like, okay. So I found a way apparently to get in the tub. I put my bottom under the water And I am not kidding. I was trying so hard to do the littlest pushes and to let him come as slowly as possible to try to not tear. But I got in that water and within one minute, he was on my chest. Like I did the slightest push, his whole body torpedoed out of my body and I was holding him on my chest and I was in complete shock. Mentally, I was still back at my house in my bathroom, like wondering if this was for real. And then physically, I'm at Origins in the birth tub with a baby on my chest and he's crying and he's perfect and he's big and chunky. And I'm like, what is going on? (laughs) It was so quick. It was so easy. It was just such a night and day difference from all that I went through trying to get Nora out. Yeah, It was amazing. I loved it so much. That is amazing. And major props to them for having the pool filled up because there probably wouldn't have been time. Exactly. Exactly. I was so glad because interestingly, I had told them at my like pre-birth appointment, I was like, I don't really think I want a water birth. I just want to labor in the water. But actually, I'm really glad that I got a water birth. It was so different than the birth stool. It was so, it was just really healing. Mm -hmm. It was really nice. So he came out, he was born at 123. So if you remember, we got in the car and over an hour away at 1223 a.m. And then he was out of my body born into this world at 1.23 oh <laughs> It was just so fast. Um, so he was pretty big. He was 21 and a quarter inches, eight pounds, 14 ounces. And unfortunately, I did have a second degree tear. However, I wasn't stressed about it because we had already made a full plan. And you know, I knew that I was going to go over to the hospital, get stitched up because I wanted to be under the care of a surgeon because of all the nonsense that had happened last time and the struggles with the stitches and all of that. I had not hemorrhaged it all this time. My placenta came out perfectly. He latched right away. He didn't have any ties. It was just so different. It was, I was like, oh, this is what people talk about. You know, yeah. I had this birth high and I was so happy and I was so like in the moment after the shock wore off. And I just never had that the first time. I never even had that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I imagine your longer term postpartum was smoother as well. It really was. So we drove over to the hospital. I went in. It was like an hour procedure. I got stitched up. This time, you know, they used a different suture material, thank God, which obviously I had told them to because I was allergic to the other one. And it all went really smoothly. It was a very normal, you know, within two weeks, I was feeling really, really good. Within four to six weeks, I was feeling pretty much back to normal, moving around, doing all the things I normally do. I, like right after I had the baby, went right back on my SSRI, which was super helpful for my mental health. And so like at two weeks postpartum with Colin, we named him Colin, I felt the same as I felt at maybe six, seven, eight months postpartum. This was two weeks. So it was just such a difference. Yeah. Well, good. That's awesome. (laughs) It was great. So just anyone out there who had a really hard time the first go around, if you choose to do it again, there's so much hope. Like there's such a chance for it to be different. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, I've yet to hear two stories that are exactly alike <laughs> or even really that close. So. <laughs> no, and I would, I always say people are like, how did you do that with the second baby coming so, so fast? And I always say like, I would take that any day over the first one yeah. because it was just, you know, like it was so easy and fast. And the midwife said, usually when a baby's coming super fast, there's almost never any issues because they're not being held up. There's no problems. They're just torpedoing right on out and everything's great. Right. Yeah. I feel like people whose first birth is precipitous feel differently, but I'm the same as you, like 34 hours and then like less than three, like I'll take that one every time. Yes. Yes, (laughs) Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, any resources you want to share? Yeah. So I actually have, I have a blog, blairblogs.com where I, I don't blog very much anymore, but I blogged all through like pregnancies and postpartums, things like that. I also have a YouTube channel where I share all the time every week um, about my family. And back when I was going through all of this, I shared tons and tons of pregnancy updates, birth updates, birth stories, postpartum, all of that. Also, Birth Boot Camp was great. We did the online course. It was really informative. I really liked it. Um, Of course, this podcast, The Birth Hour, is great. And then if anyone has been through something traumatic and you are not finding a lot of healing for that, I highly recommend, if you haven't tried it, looking into the EMDR therapy because I found so much healing with that. And I had never even heard of it before, Mm -hmm. but I I just really recommend it. It worked wonders for me. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a lot of great things as well. All right. And then you mentioned a few different things that you're up to, but where's the best place for people to reach out to connect? Probably the best place is Instagram. And my handle there is Blair Blogs, which is just B-L-A-I-R-B-L-O-G-S. All right. Perfect. Well, thanks, Blair. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again to Blair for sharing her story with us. You can find out more on her show notes, which you can always find at thebirthhour.com by searching for the guest's name in the search bar. I'm hoping to be able to keep a regular schedule starting next week. Uh, So hopefully we will see you back on Tuesday with a new episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.